Here off the Florida Keys, one of the world's great treasure hunters spent 15 years searching for the wreck of one of the richest treasure ships ever. Finally, Mel Fisher found the Atocha, which yielded hundreds of millions in gold and silver. Now, 15 years later, the Fisher organization is still harvesting the Atocha wreck site, and we'll be joining them in their hunt for Spanish treasure. The story of Mel Fisher and his search for the Atocha is probably the best known of all treasure hunts. In 1985, after 15 years of dogged search and personal tragedy, they finally found the Spanish galleon and what has turned out to be the richest treasure recovery ever, a record that stands to this day. In 1622, an armada of treasure ships carrying riches from the New World left Havana headed for Spain. Just days later, the fleet was hit by a terrible hurricane. The Atocha, its hold stacked high with silver ingots, sank with the loss of all 258 passengers. The bulk of the treasure found in 85 was from the main section of the ship. The Fisher's team has continued to work the site on and off ever since. They believe the Atocha has only given up a portion of its treasure. The ship broke up on a reef, and the strength of the storm spread the wreckage over a large area. The stern castle, the part of the ship which housed the officers and wealthy passengers, actually broke off and was driven some distance before it finally disappeared below the waves. Now, Fisher's main salvage vessel, the Magruder, has hit upon what they think is a new spread of coins and artifacts. And if what they've been finding is any indication, they are getting closer and closer to the stern castle of the richest treasure ship of all time. On board the Magruder, Gary Randolph, the ship's captain, showed us what they've been finding in just the past few days alone. Let's check out the goodies. These are the gold bars found over the last few days. Can I hold it? Sure. Isn't that fabulous? And it's got a tally number on there, and that was just bar number 159. Got to be another 150 of them out here. Good, <laughs> good. What's the difference in an ounce of this kind of gold as opposed to an ounce of a Cougar Rand gold? Three or four hundred dollars an ounce, whatever gold goes for now, right. compared to uh, probably $90,000 that the piece is going to be worth because of its rarity. And What's this encrusted object here? This is a beautiful gold chain encrusted all through this object. Right. See it runs go right through, into right here. through here, runs right into there, goes underneath, runs through here, and it comes out the back. Do you suspect that there's something else or is it just the chain? No, I think there's there's probably something else in here. Yeah, if it, it, seems if it, it fell in one clump like this, maybe it was like a little jewelry box of somebody's or something like that. You know, maybe there's a like gold cross yeah. in there or some emerald ring. That's or what something. it kind of looks like. like yeah. There might be a cross. Yep. How long will it take to get everything off of there? Well what we'll do first what we'll do first is x-ray it so we know what we have, and then we could come up with a plan of attack so we don't damage anything. Good. <laughs> Good. I'm with you. The Magruder has been specially rigged for treasure hunting. At the rear are two large metal funnels called mailboxes, used to direct the wash from the props toward the sandy bottom. They literally blow a hole in the sand right down to the bedrock. Back in Key West, they were already working on some of the artifacts found close by. An array of weapons usually stored near the captain's cabin, and pieces of an amazing lock the kind that would be used on a treasure chest, all evidence they were closing in on the stern castle. Like what kind of sign are you looking for that would tip you off that this actually would be the stern castle? Things like we've been finding. The gold, gold bars. bars. And the gold chains that would be owned by uh, rich passengers that weren't on the manifest. Instead of coins. Right, More, yeah, okay. yeah, there's some silver coins in this area, a pretty good amount of silver coins also, but the gold is the, the giveaway. You know, that was only in one section of the ship, and that was the stern castle. They finished blowing out the first hole of the day, so we suited up and went looking for Spanish treasure. The mailboxes have left what looks like a giant pit in the sand. We swim down into it and towards the exposed bedrock. This is where anything metallic is most likely to be found. Over time, most treasure sinks through the sand, ending up on the bottom. Using metal detectors, 
we do a meticulous sweep of the hole and even the thick berm of sand thrown up by the mailboxes. Treasure can still be hiding in here as well. During the half hour it takes to do a complete sweep of the exposed bottom, I don't get a single beep off the detector. No luck, but this is just the first dive of the day. Woo! Treasure hunt. Love it. The crew repositions the Magruder by winching the anchor lines until the ship is about 15 feet off the first side of the day. Then the process begins again. While we wait for the mailboxes to blow out the next hole, Gary shows me how meticulously they chart everything they find. Well, the circles are excavation holes where we're um, digging a hole. Like right now, they're about a 20-foot diameter hole that how we're deep? digging in the bottom. It's about 10 feet of sand we're digging through. Right. And that represents the area of bedrock that's exposed on the bottom after we're done digging. Mm -hmm. The colors Purple, represent right. different types of artifacts. Right. The purple represents silver coins. The green represents um, iron artifacts like spikes and um, ships fittings and other cannonballs. hardware. Cannonballs. Right. Um, the yellow represents gold, and this is the area we've been finding all the gold. How many uh, nautical miles does this cover? This is a little over a mile, this area okay. right here. And where are we now? We are right here, okay. and we're going to fill this in today, right here. Where that black dot is? Yep, where that black dot okay. is. Yep. In terms of hot spots, uh, how does this particular one where we are right this now measure up? Very hot. This yeah. is an excellent area. Seeing a lot of yellow circles. A lot of yellow circles, yeah. And we've been finding gold for the last five days straight, so hopefully we'll find it today. It'll be our sixth straight day with gold. The next hole is ready to be explored. So everyone suits up again, and in we go. I follow the guideline that leads straight down to the new hole, over the berm, and in we go. The objects we're looking for usually become totally encrusted in the hundreds of years of exposure on the sea bottom, making them almost impossible to pick up with the naked eye. The metal detectors are the only way to be sure not to miss anything, and I am beginning to understand how methodical and focused one has to be to do this sort of work. And then... I think my heart almost skips a beat when I hear that sound. A single disc-shaped object fused right to the coral. I can't believe I've actually found a piece of Spanish treasure. Piece of eight, right there. Look at that. At first I thought, I thought Gary put it there, but when I went to pick it up, it was stuck and crusted to the bottom. I knew he wasn't pulling my leg at that point. It's a great feeling. Got a slight glimpse of the rush you guys must get. Once again, the crew winches the Magruder into a new position, and everyone takes a break while another hole is blown in the sandy bottom. We've been moving along in one direction, and then you decided to jog back and go back the other direction. Why is that? Well, we're following the trends on the chart. Um, it shows this certain area in the center of the trail is pretty hot with treasure. So when we work our way out to the side, and it starts to run out, we'll go back and just keep working back and forth across that hot area until we work it out. Okay, and when you say drop back, uh, about how far do you drop back each time? We only move about 15 feet each time so we can overlap each hole so we don't miss any section of the bedrock. Right, so you're just on the edge of each hole. Yeah, maybe this next hole will have gold I in it. I still feel it. I know, there's something. It's close by. Yeah. <laughs> Once yeah. you get the fever, ah. you don't lose <laughs> it. It stays with you forever. Oh, yeah. This time, it wasn't more than a minute or two before Gary got a strong hit on his metal detector. There was something buried in the berm, something much bigger than just a couple of coins. They stick a small piece of plywood above the spot to keep the sand in place and continue to dig by hand. 
I didn't think it was possible for excitement to be contagious underwater, but everyone could feel it. Whatever it is, it's too deep to dig out by hand, so they bring down a special tube which sucks out the sand quickly. And then we suddenly see it. I'm not sure what it is exactly, but it's definitely not shiny and yellow. And Gary's expression, even underwater, makes it clear this is not anything we were hoping for. Genuine grade one, <laughs> aluminum tin. An old cookie tin, garbage from some 20th century cabin cruiser. Bummer. You can mount that on your wall. No gold today, but what the Magruder crew has been finding is hard evidence they are getting close to something big. Mel Fisher's team has hit pay dirt in this area before. The gold and emeralds on display back in Key West testify to that. Gary Randolph knows there's more out here somewhere. As he continues the hunt Mel Fisher began almost 30 years before, as the Atocha, one of Spain's richest treasure ships, continues to yield treasure from the ocean floor.